among friends. So I said I will not be too serious, considering that we have been, uh, we have been uh, in Malaysia, we are invariably you know, surrounded by uh, vast quantities of chicken. Um, I said I will do a chicken lecture instead and uh, keep you, uh, at least after that heavy breakfast, uh, in a lighter mood. Now, this is a reward for the chickens. Now, the reason why we have taken up this entire multiversity project is in the end the, the, the focal point of all the universities, which is not professors and not students and not uh, administrators and buildings, but the students. And the students are having it having a difficult time. Most people go back to Bologna, the first university, a Western University. Uh, 1,088. But don't, don't recall that the, this Bologna University was set up by students. It was set up, the very word university, universitas, comes from unions of students who got together in Bologna because they were being harassed by the local authorities for all sorts of various offenses and they needed people to guide them on how to get it. So the first university was actually set up by the student unions from Germany and from all different parts of Europe who call themselves nations. They set themselves up, they hired and fired the professors. And they had with them the capacity of a professor was not good enough, they could fire him. Now, that situation, you know, today is not the case. Today we are just in the reverse situation, where the only, only um, imagery that you can use is, uh, is you know, um, what a young student said in the last conference in the Global Higher Education Forum in, in Malaysia, which still sticks in my head. He said that um, the relationship existing, and our professor sitting in front of him, the relation existing between university and students today is more akin to one obtaining between a master and a slave. He was very clear about this. He described the features of masters, people who know everything, people who must be obeyed, as they have the power to punish. You don't do, you don't follow, you're out of the class, you're out of the college, you're out of the street. And this, therefore there are people, masters, who can never be wrong. And then he said, you have to counterpose to this the qualities of slaves, that is students today. So they are weak, they are assumed that they have no civilization, they have no knowledge, and their sole role is to obey orders and regulations which have been set up by their masters and the institutions the masters represent. And this is a complete 180 degree turn for Bologna, but nevertheless, let us pass. We don't need to worry too much about it. In other universities, assume that students have neither personality nor desire, and everything is to be laid down for them. Like where they should get into the bus, the route the bus will take to its final destination, and where they can get off. There is, in other words, no scope for free range poultry or free range birds, only scope for battery chickens. And that's why um, I, am, uh, I thought that I illustrate this lecture today with pictures of chickens. This is battery chickens, uh, students produced by battery chicken mode in Delhi. The same bland prefabricated food feed is said is, is given to all chickens worldwide. There's no, there's, no definite, there's no distinction between maize. It may be genetically modified maize in, in the US or you know not genetically modified maize in some other part of the world. But it's all the same standard ration which has been analyzed by veterinary scientists and they give this to them whether they like it or not. And there's no choice in the matter. Student cannot say that I won't study this and why should I study that? There's no choice the system. You either stay in, take this or get out. So it's the industrial system that's really determining your choices of how you sell your labor. So it naturally deter determines your feed, the speed of the consumption of the feed and the quantity of the feed. Now I would like to connect this with what Zul said on university education, which is still one of the very, another paragraph. I, do, I don't remember essays and all, but I remember one paragraph. You can stay, imagine the state of my mind. He says, I can draw a good parallel 
between the education system, the university education system and the factory system is that the university is almost like an assembly line where the student moves from classroom to classroom, lecturers are like the operators in charge, examinations are another label for quality control. You pass the examination, move to the next conveyor belt. At the end of the day, you are ready for the market. You are successful if you are absorbed, you are unsuccessful if you are not absorbed. These are Taiwani students on the assembly line and they have reached the absurd status where they have to continuously copy from each other so that the administrators have come up with new caps to prevent them from looking at each other's papers. I say, how much, how much more ludicrous can it get? But anyway, this picture should actually give you the best. See, at the end of my education, this is how I felt. I had no feathers left. All my self-respect was gone. I was now a newly certified groom, but I had nothing at all left with me. And whatever was left was something that would be just eaten by anybody, by any employer. So that's my condition. You can keep it for my passport. And I don't think that a passport officer would find any difference between the two. You may look at look upon me as something to eat. But you know, just in case you think that this is only the situation of our students, at our last conference, at the uh, conference in, uh, you know, in the, in the 2011 conference, we have a guy from China. Now he said, don't think that students are the only chickens. And he described the educational scenario in China, also in terms of chickens. Now let me just quote the way he looked at it, because it's in term, it's, it's very relevant to the ranking system, which is a big issue in Malaysia. So according to this guy, there's a guy called Yi Song Tian, a popular member of the Chinese intelligentsia, who observed about the ranking disease in China in 2009 itself already. There was already a ranking disease in China. Since the education ministry launched the reform in the form of quantitative management, all China's universities have become chicken farms. If you want to be promoted from an instructor to an associate professor, you have to lay so many eggs. If you want to be promoted from an associate professor to professor, you have to lay so many more eggs. And the places to lay the eggs, that is authoritative publications and journals, are also prescribed. So teachers are so busy laying eggs that they have no time to teach the students or do research. And just recently, they, 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 went, they took it to a new scheme and they said, hey, now you should begin to lay more innovative eggs. More is not enough. <laughs> Try and produce more qualitative eggs. So according to the sociological theory, which converts ranked universities into ranked chicken farms, Harvard lays the most eggs. Why? Now, I got the Harvard chicken for you. That's the average. They are a little bit better, better cages, and, and there's not that much of a stink of many things there. They're very well clean and so on. They're better, better. They are better still, they're battery chickens, but they are average chickens. Harvard battery. Harvard operating budget is 3 billion US dollars. Endowment is 39.4. These are the latest figures. And another $7.9 billion for short term cost, the largest financial endowment of any academic institution in the world. And yet, this is the same institution that produced all the people behind the 2008 financial crisis. And no blame, they didn't go to jail because they were trained in Harvard. And you want some of your children to go to Harvard. Revenue from students alone comes to 660 million. Total earnings from fundraising is 650 million. Donors include Rockefeller and Gates and includes even Indian businessmen like Ratan Tata who gave them 50 million, Narayan Murthy of Infosys who gave them 5.2 million. They are not willing to give their own college institutions in India but they are willing to give Harvard. 
licensing and branding every time you wear these branded you know uh, Harvard t-shirts gets you 150 million US dollars a year and total estimated annual income is 9.3 billion 9.33 billion a year so you could say with any common sense if Harvard with just 21,000 students gets so much of money it better produce the maximum number of eggs <laughs> there's no way out for them if they don't people are going to ask questions because no other university gets this type of money. Now you want to take the figures. Annual budget of University of Southern Maine for 10,000 students is only 140 million US dollars. This is the US. And US and Penang annual budget with 30,000 students is 250 million US dollars. Makarere University in Africa with 40,000 students is 25 million US dollars. Delhi University with 40, with 400,000 students, 4 lakh students, is 47 US million, million US dollars. Just try and let it all digest it because you never see these figures and you don't know what is privilege in education and why certain people get. Now, you look, if you, if the, the water ranking system does, they simply pit these obscenely rich institutions against the obscenely poor and come to the wholly redundant and obvious revelation that the rich rank first, <laughs> they eat better, they dress better, they speak and they write better. Their degrees are an advantage when looking for jobs with trimmings because pedigree is more often more advantages than even merit and that's still the basis of selection. And Harvard spends $126,000 on each student. Princeton spends $113,000 on each student. Now you would say that with all this money, do they really produce anything? And then there were surveys done of Princeton, for example. It says, does it prepare students to be leaders? Now we're talking about leadership conferences, their career fields and in the community. How far does it deliver? And they, they did a survey of 934 students from the class of 1973 who are now in their 50s. And the survey found that none of them had served in any cabinet or sub cabinet, either in any congressional chamber as a federal judge or as a financial officer or a chief officer of a national corporation. And many gravitated to professions which are very modest careers, and their average income was probably. 170,000 US dollars for men and 115,000 for women. These are, if you go to Princeton, these are the ultimate rewards on your investment. And they found that uh, uh, in the University of Philadelphia, uh, you, if, you, if, you, if, you, if you went into the university and got your certification, when you came out, you had as much chance of a job as a person living in the slum in Philadelphia outside. I mean, the unemployment rate was the same for both. Then you have the Spellings Commission. It's called Spellings Commission, but it's basically what is the result of all this money and the investment itself? It warned of a rising tide of mediocrity. Now, I don't know why brilliant students from here should want to migrate to the United States to join a rising tide of mediocrity. Because, but this, this is what happens. Today's graduates of the United States, the Commission says, Lack the skills and the information that should be absorbed while earning, earning, earning a bachelor's. For example, it is reported that from two, 1992 to 2003, fewer than a dozen years, the number of graduates found to be proficient in reading fell from 37% to 25%. <laughs> this is the state in the United States of America. Forget about any other part of the world. And only a fifth of them, only a fifth, do very commonplace tasks like computing the total of an office supply of order. Now how did these students get these, how did these colleges get these reputations? You find that, look at, they, they, they did a research of the collection area of Harvard and they found that 50% of the successful applicants to Harvard Law School and Yale came from 12 Ivy League colleges. And 50% came from 300 of the remaining. So that means the institution already gets the best of these colleges. So that's why it's already the best. It's 
It's not getting the dumbest guys and making them into brilliant guys for all the money that they're investing. They're already getting the best guys. <laughs> and then they're charging them these phenomenal rates. And then they're saying we have the best university in the world. So I'm not interested in our situation because I see sometimes it be a reflection of what's happening there. So this is a picture of education and what students have to face. Now you would think that you know uh, uh, things have improved in the in the US and in Europe and so on. Um, I have got these slides which I show at most of my meetings of how the situation has not changed for uh, for a hundred years. This is the one I showed last time. This is the lecture room in in 1353 in a, in a European university and you can see that there are people sleeping behind, there are people talking, there's a lecture on the table and uh, you know uh, there are people with their books open, today they'll be there with their laptops open and with their notebooks and so on. But the situation has really not changed. You think that with better money we would have better teaching methods, there would be better things but I mean I don't think that in that sense you can say the situation has changed at all. Today's students are now the abuse law. First they were the, uh, the employers, but today they have reached a stage where now they are the they are the focus of, of abuse. So then students, if you look at this master and slave thing, you say who's a master and who's a slave? And if you look at a knowledge system, which I will go into now, but not into in a very serious way, the the system says students are slaves of the professors, of the lecturers. But then you figure out that the lecturers and professors are also slaves, but they are slaves in two ways. One is they are slaves as the Chinese officials said, that today they have got to get into this ranking thing as chickens. But there is another one in which they are slaves, that is they have to blindly copy and propagate the predominant theories prevailing in the system of knowledge in the countries of Europe. That is, I mean, that is the standard given by life, and I don't think that has changed. And the decolonization uh, process has been trying to change that, but uh, we have gotten more and more supporters, but uh, it's not working too well and too successfully right now. Because if we adopt the same methods as the system and do it with a lot of grand money and great conferences and all sorts of things, then I think that we will probably end up in the same place. Now the Knowledge system. This knowledge system, there are three responses to it. I spoke about these three responses in, in depth in the other in the other uh, uh, meeting that we had at Houston, so I'm not going to speak about them here, but they will be in the final, in the paper that I am... Uh, uh, but there are three responses. The first response is a group of people who say that they, 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 uh, they, they say no to any education or any influence from which is done on the European or Western auspices or concepts and uh, sometimes they make their uh, you know opinion <coughs> very clear they make it very clear <laughs> that you try to even fly an aircraft over them and they will, <laughs> they will give you the message that we don't want to be any part of this knowledge system the second part is as I told you those who say that we can have both we have a railway going on two parallel tracks there's the our knowledge system and their knowledge system and it can go. The railways can go to a destination or they can, the tracks can go on to infinity. And nobody really benefits from each other. And the third is the class, which is also still a strong class, which says that Western education system is useful, predominant and better chicken feed. So, now this class of views, in my opinion, was dismissed by African, our African writer, Gugi Vatyongo, who said very simply, I, I lose the wrong He said very simply, it is the final triumph of a system of domination when the dominated people begin to sing its virtues. Let me repeat that. It is the final triumph of a system of domination when the dominated start singing its virtues. Now I'm not going to go into what I went to use here, but there are these the the title of the presentation was the revolt of the chickens.
So I would like to spend a little bit of time on that because I've got just about 10, 15 minutes left. And give you some sort of brief survey about what has been happening because this, this revolt against the knowledge system actually started with Gandhi. And most of you know that, I mean, most of you don't know, that Gandhi wrote a very interesting book in 1908 called Hind Swaraj. In that book, he states very clearly, and this is a very, very peaceful man, not used to harsh words, uh, also of non violence, but he said if anybody is involved in this business of transmitting European civilization anywhere on this planet, he should be banned to the penal colony of the Andamans. The Andamans was the place where all the hardened criminals were sent from, from India and they had to, they had, even the freedom fighters and all, everybody was sent there. But this was the imagery that this man used when he was talking about the encounter. Now, he was a man who was also trained in Western law and all that came back and decided that that was not something that uh, he would like to propagate. Uh, among the among the uh, citizens of his own country. Well, most of us in the decolonization project begin from him because he is the first person to, to express what he felt. And then he started of course his own education system called Nayitalim, which is still in operation in many parts of the country even today. And of course there have been many others like Maududi who was the founder of Jamaati Islami who actually in a convocation address to students, he was invited to give a convocation address to students, he says universities have become slaughterhouses. I talked about chicken farms, but he has very vivid imagery about universities being slaughterhouses. How to take people who come, who don't know what to do, who don't know what to choose, who don't know where to go, who have come there because of the hard-earned efforts of their parents and so on to get a good education. And then they leave devastated. Where most of them are declared as failures. If you are, for example, in a, in, a, in, a, in a school in Delhi, you have to get 98% of marks in your highest secondary examination to get into three of the main colleges in Delhi, St. Stephen's, Miranda's, and St. Lady. And if you don't, in the entire population of Delhi, you are considered a failure. Even if you have succeeded, you've got 97%, you've got 96%, forget about those who have got 25% and so on. They'll probably be kept for the, the, the handcuffs. But these guys are told that they are not good enough. Now those guys who go into those colleges, they end up in the same situation afterwards. Because I remember a report written by just last year by a professor who, who went to study the uh, Stephen, the St. Stephen's uh, Miranda's economics lecturers, how they were doing them. And he found that the lecturer there, so I'm not, it was nothing that happened in Harvard or here or whatever, the lecturer at St. Stephen's College of Economics was dictating notes from his book, and when the bell rang, he stopped where he was. That means in the middle of the sentence, and the next day when he came, he resumed exactly where he had left off. Now obviously there is going to be some, some sort of a revolt against governments and people are going to get upset because if you ask a normal person living in South America or Africa or India why you know you got to study this, he will say what, is that, what have I got to do? What have I got to do with European sociology? And what have I got to do with American psychology? And why should I study the history of people who I don't even know and who I am not even bothered about and who I will never even encounter for the rest of my life? And so they walk out. He said that this is not a place for us. I mean, there might be uh, people who are not normal who may want to do these things, but normal people could not be found doing them at all. And so there have been groups in these in South America, for example. I'm uh, very good, glad that uh, Sanju Hira is here. He's going to talk about in the next lecture. South America, there's a lot of people who have created system for decolonial thinking. We have not been able to link up with them because of language and because of distance. But we intend to. Now you have people like uh, like Dr. Maripa Ani. I, I don't know whether you, you, you know her too, but she is, I mean her book, Yoruba, 
is probably one of the classic texts which everybody would be invited to read. Because it, it says very bluntly that the Yoruba system, the cosmology, the cosmogony, the epistemology is intact and well enough to ensure the mental and physical well-being of people who subscribe to it. There is no need for them to touch anything from, from Europe or from the United States or from any other place. Molefi Asante came in 2011 and delivered more or less similar lines. There are more conventional ways in which this is being done. For example, uh, Dr. Farid uh, Alatas is going to address us tomorrow. Now he has been doing what few intellectuals in, the, in our countries have been doing. He is teaching courses in sociology, which don't have any reference to August Holm and Marx Weber and so on. But they have references to sociologists, for example, in the Philippines, to Rizal in the Philippines, or to Radha Kamal Mukherjee in India, Gandhi, and so on. So by just by changing the sources and the thinkers, at least he has salvaged his reputation and come out with a course that at least is defensive. I mean, it's okay, you are teaching sociology, you don't know why you are teaching it. But if you are teaching it at least to reflect the people and the thinkers who have worked in sociology and who have tried to do something unusual in sociology, use different categories of thinking, introduce new debates, and also new involvements with the society at large, uh, rather than link up with some distant mental superstructure somewhere, which, which students really don't have any any uh, any relationship. Because in Iran, we've had a very good group uh, which has been building up uh, ever since the Supreme Commander there said that you know we really should do away with all these social Western social sciences. But of course, they've got a huge group also which is as strongly entrenched as groups in other parts. We say, no, no, we want to have Western education. I don't know why people who want Western education, for example, still remain in Iran. They should go to the West. There's no problem. The, you have your foot here, but you want something else there. God has put you here. He has not put you there. But you want to leave here and go there. There's something that I have not been able to understand. Why somebody who has been put as a, to, to work in an area of challenge in a particular country should then migrate some 6,000, 7,000 kilometers to some other place? Something that's way beyond the question. This is the situation. In Alaska, we have had very good, there's a good university, University of Alaska at Fairbanks, which is working with the Eskimos. They have created an entire educational system their own thinkers, their own language, their own discipline. Because they said many of the things that are useful to Alaska are not taught anyway in any case. And it's very thriving and it's very elaborate. It's one of the most elaborate systems of higher education in the world. And if you look at the American Indian, the Canadian groups, the American groups and so on, they have, as a matter of fact, come out with huge amounts of you know, uh, very carefully articulated presuppositions, assumptions, theories and so on, which we, we have not, our societies were not devastated physically as the, as the American Indians of Canada and America. We were not, or they were not disrupted like the people in Africa. We are still there, we are large masses of people. But despite being that, we are still not able to get out of uh, that situation. Can you wrap up? Yeah. And we have had, of course, some groups who are the, the Maoris. Uh, there is another very good example, Dr. Mari Batist, who has done something on this. You have the, uh, uh, the Maoris. Maoris are a very good example of people uh, who are uh, uh, actually infiltrated into the system. As a matter of fact, you can't read a paper written by a Maori social scientist or because they, they infuse it with all Maori words. So the language becomes inscrutable. So outsiders can't quote it. They use English, but they use Maori words. We have, of course, Southern perspectives. We have represented here. We have, uh, so these are people who have all become part of a huge community of decolonizers. And we are hoping to get them together constantly in these meetings to bombard each other and share each other's experiences. Because the decolonial agenda has, is inevitable. 